Hello, I'm Hank. So you're spending an entire year in space, which is cool, but you're also very much offering up your living body for scientific experimentation here, and you are going to have significant health impacts because of this research. What makes you willing and even enthusiastic to do that? Well, all, uh, all astronauts that uh, fly in space are uh, human subjects, so it's, this is just not about me. It's, uh, you know, something we all do. Uh, certainly I'll be up here a little bit longer, um, but the reason I'm willing to do this is I think it's uh, important research that we do and it's going to be critical someday to us, uh, you know, going further out into space and hopefully to Mars someday. Hi, I'm Louis Cole. I travel the world and make videos for my YouTube channel, Fun for Louis. And in my adventures, I find there's a lot of obstacles I come across. What's been the biggest obstacle of the mission that you're on and how did you overcome it? Well, uh, this is my uh, fourth time in space, my second long duration flight. So I kind of eased into this uh, pretty easily. It kind of felt like I had, um, really never left. It's really amazing how your body remembers the environment. Um, I think, though, the biggest obstacle or the biggest challenge will be the, the duration of, of this flight, you know, just being here for so long, never being able to leave, never being able to leave your place of work. So, you know, so far it's been a pretty seamless transition, but, I, you know, I expect as I'm here longer it'll be uh, get more challenging in that regard. Hi, astronaut Kelly. I'm Emily Grassley from The Brain Scoop, standing in front of our meteorite collection here at the Field Museum in Chicago. My question for you. I know you're studying your immune system's responses and functionality while living in space for a year. So considering how much of a person's healthy immune system has evolved for millions of years along with life forms on Earth, do you have any predictions for how humans could maintain a well-balanced microbiome while living in space without things like plants, animals, or microbes gleaned from life forms on Earth? Thanks. You know, that's a good question. I, I do know that one of the studies I'm participating in is this microbiome research. Um, you know, we do get some, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables up here in our diet is, uh, you know, not exactly the same it is on Earth. But uh, I really hadn't considered that, you know, what the impact uh to living here on the, the microbiome of our, our bodies is. Um, but I guess, you know, there is some, and certainly that's why we're doing the research. So hopefully, uh, you know, this experiment will, will find those answers. I, I don't have a personal hypothesis, but I'm sure, you know, the experimenters do. And if you want more information, I'm sure your NASA contact, uh, you know, can, can get that for you. Hey, Mr. Kelly, Kyle Hill here from Because Science on the Nerdist channel in Los Angeles. I'm wondering, surveying the popular culture landscape and what you know of our future space missions, what do you think will be the thing that inspires the next generation of astronauts to be the first generation of Martian astronauts? Thanks, and good luck. Well, you know, I hope uh, kids get inspiration from uh, the space program like they do other places. Uh, you know, hopefully what we're doing here inspires kids to study uh, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, math subjects, because those are critical uh, to our future, not only our space program, but to our economy as a whole. So, you know, I hope they get some inspiration from what we're doing here. I hope they also get inspiration from, you know, their friends and family and, uh, you know, people that they uh, learn from, their teachers, um, you know, whatever role models they may have, because that is our future and, you know, kids are our future. Hi, Scott. I'm Henry Reich from the YouTube channels Minute Physics and Minute Earth. I've always been fascinated by the instability of rotation around the intermediate axis of an object. For example, if you rotate around the axis of large angular inertia, it's a stable rotation. If you rotate around the uh, the very smallest axis of inertia, it is also a stable rotation. But if you try to rotate around the intermediate axis of rotation, it's unstable. You see these things flip back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. And you can see this is obviously a challenge here on Earth because we have to throw things through the air and it's a mess. And I was wondering if you might be able to do a demo for us on the ISS. Thanks for your time and I hope you enjoy your year in space. 
Yeah, I guess what you're talking about is how this Leatherman tool is ro it'll rotate along one axis and then flip over. Um, so I hope that was a good demonstration. I'll do it again here real quick as we go to the next uh, question and hope you can see this. Hello, Scott. My name is Michael Stevens from the YouTube channel Vsauce. Uh, I'm asking this question from Toronto, Ontario, and my question is about cosmic ray visuals. I've heard that up in space, stray cosmic rays can cause you to see flashes of light. Has that ever happened to you? And if so, what does it look like? You know, the first time I saw those was on my Hubble Space Telescope uh, mission in 1999. The Hubble flies a lot higher than the space station, so we can see a lot more of those cosmic rays. Uh, I would see, you know, on order of maybe like 50 an hour. Uh, but the space station is, is lower and a little bit more protected from those. Um, and you see them much less frequently, although I'll see, you know, maybe a few each night. Uh, in my previous experience with Hubble, they were very much more distinct and would kind of look like they were just white flashes of light like a firework that was kind of radial towards the center of my eye. Now they seem a little bit different, uh, and I don't know if that's because of the altitude we're at, but a little bit more not as uh, well-defined, not uh, and, and kind of more random in, in you know, how they uh, uh, streak across my field of view, I guess I should say. But, um, you know, I was thinking about it last night when I saw one, thinking about, hey, not only is this thing going across my visual field, but it's also going through my brain. Hey, Scott, it's Destin from Smarter Every Day. Enjoyed working with you. Hope to do it again. Drop me an email if you're interested. Quick question, what kind of watch do you wear? I know you have two, but I don't know why. What features are important on an astronaut's watch? Stay safe with their Commander. Hey, Destin, uh, good to hear from you. Um, so normally the watch I wear up here is an Omega watch uh, because uh, one reason the Omega is good is because it has a very loud alarm. It has a light that is very bright. It's uh, one that was designed for space. The light you can almost use as a flashlight in, if it's really dark, uh, like in the evenings. Uh, today I'm wearing a Breitling that my brother gave me because I was just talking to him on the Today Show. So, uh, But I normally don't wear this watch during the working day. And the other one is a sleep study watch that Misha and I have to wear the whole time we're up here, which measures acceleration. In other words, whether you're moving around or not, and light. So it can tell, you know, pretty accurately when we're asleep and when we're awake. Hey, this is Hank again. So imagine when the thrust of that last rocket stops and you become weightless for the first time of, of the journey. It feels initially like you're falling because that's what you're doing. You're really falling around the earth and missing it for a year. It's that moment when the airplane drops in the turbulence or you're at the top of the roller coaster and you feel that feeling in your stomach. That's what I imagine it feels like. When does that feeling stop? Or does it stop? Or do you just feel like you're falling forever? Well, on, on launch, it, it stops pretty quickly. You know, um, I think some people don't even ever experience it. I don't really feel that way for long on launch after the engines uh, cut off and you first experience uh, microgravity. You know, however, you know, I can go in my crew quarters at night when it's dark and I'm getting ready to go to sleep and close my eyes and, you know, convince myself I do have a feeling of falling, but it takes a little bit of effort. But we are. We're, you know, that's why everything floats here is because, you know, it's not because we're so far away from the Earth and the gravity is low. It's because we're all in free fall around the Earth at the same time. So I can convince myself that I feel that, although I don't feel it right this second as I'm talking to you. Hi, I'm Louis Cole. I travel the world filming videos for my YouTube channel. And doing what you're doing, staying up on the International Space Station is the biggest adventure I could imagine, and I'm sure it has been for you. But if you could travel to anywhere else in space, any solar system or planet, where would it be? You know, people normally ask, you know, 
if you could travel to any other place in our solar system, and then I generally say Mars, but the way you pose the question, I think if I could go anywhere, it would probably be to a planet that astronomers and scientists have just, uh, determined is most like Earth, and uh, you know to see what's really there. You know if there are living creatures, or, or you know just how that planet is evolved and how similar it really is to our home planet. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you.